Hello. So I believe I should be live now. I hope so. Um, technology, not my forte. Um, welcome to this live stream. If anyone has any questions, then you can start dropping them in the chat. I don't know which side it's on. Things are a little bit backwards. Um, so I suppose the best place to start would be with a bit of an introduction. Um, so if you've been watching the videos this week, then you'll know that I'm Tilda and I go by Woodsmoke and Words Online. Uh, I am a professional costume maker and hat maker, and I cosplay as a hobby. Um, so I pretty much just think about costumes constantly. Um, I also studied costume interpretation at university, um, so I have a, I have a degree in it, um, and I've been working in the industry for four years, I think now. Um, on top of this, I'm a huge dress history nerd, um, and I like to incorporate that into cosplay as much as it comes up in my job um so it's not something it's not something that I do professionally but it is something that I'm massively passionate about and have been interested in since about 2012 um you know if you're not including growing up you know visiting the V&A every possible opportunity and walking around the fashion galleries <laughs> whenever I could um so I'm gonna see what the chat is doing at the moment ah hello there's some people there already, that's nice. So I guess the best place to start would be with some questions that I managed to grab off of people on Instagram and Twitter prior to this. Um, and uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll get to answering some of those first. So um, the first one I have on my list here is um, that someone would love to know about the process of putting all that braid on my uniform for Nikolai. So for those who aren't aware, Nikolai is the um, character who is in the thumbnail for these videos. Um, he's a character from Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse books and historical costume or historical dress comes into this with uh, the fact that I based his costume off of um, Regency era Hussar military uniforms. So the Hussars were a mounted cavalry regiment um, and they had really, really elaborate uniforms. Um, and I, I felt that that was right for Nikolai. Um, so the braid was a bit of an adventure. Um, it took it took an awful lot. Um, I believe there's another question to do with making uh, a hussar coat. So I'll, I'll kind of address both of these at the same time. Um, so I didn't use a pattern because I drape all of my own patterns. Um, I tend to I tend to drape on the stand. I don't flat draft, which is um, not necessarily more historical because there were different techniques used at different points in history. Flat drafting and draping are both historical techniques, but they were used at different times um, and for different things, the same as they are now. So, you know, certain garments are easier to drape on the stand and certain garments are easier to draft flat. Um, but I I have dyscalculia, which is like dyslexia for maths, and I hate flat drafting. So I drape on the stand as much as I can. So both of those coats, both the dolman, which is the jacket that you wear, and the police, which is the one that's draped over your shoulder, um, were draped on the stand. Um, they are based off of um, Hussar uniforms from around 1815. Um, and I found a lot of those references on Pinterest, which is a really useful resource. Although, of course, it's not great for... Um, you know the the heaps of stolen images that are on it um the braid which is probably the most eye-catching thing about it um is there's there's three different types of braid on there so there's a flat um military or naval lace which is the gold braid that runs around the cuffs and around the very edges it's about an inch wide um and then there's soutache or russia braid um which is the the kind that looks like two thin bits of braid joined together with a little like dip in the middle. Um, there's two different widths of that on that jacket. Um, mine is actually more simple than a lot of the historical ones. Um, it's got, um, oh God, I think I used about 25 meters of a seven millimeter wide one and 30-ish meters of a, a smaller thin one, which was about two millimeters wide. Um, and I figured out how much I was going to order. This is, I think, the biggest thing. Um, I had my pattern on the mannequin and I used some just like wool yarn and I pinned it on in the pattern that I was going to use and then took it all off and then measured it out so I knew how many meters to order, um, which was just really, really useful because otherwise I probably would have had to do multiple orders because I, I assume I would have underestimated how much I needed it to take a lot. It is... Um, all hand sewn on. I probably could have done it by machine. You can put it on by machine, but it tends to kind of 
bunch up and, and kink in a uh, an unflattering way if you're not careful with it and I really enjoy hand stitching so that all of that braid is hand stitched on um I did this before putting my lining in um and before sewing up my shoulder seams so on both the jackets um I did the side seams and the side back seams so they could be laid flat and I hand stitched all of this on um I marked it out with chalk you start with the thinner one um, and once you've got that on, it kind of acts as a guide for the next layer of soutache, which is the, the seven mil millimeter wide one. And then, um, yeah, pinned it and then hand stitched it down and then stitched up my shoulder seams and put the lining in and put the, you know, finished the edges and, and all that. Um, I hope that thoroughly enough answered both of those questions. Um, it's kind of, it was a long, it was a long process. <laughs> uh, it took a lot of work, but I loved every second of it. Um, did you just stitch it down the ridge of the braid? Uh, yeah, kind of. I just I just stitched in stitched in the ditch in the middle. Um, and and stitching stitching in the ditch is another sewing term. It's usually you know you use it when you're doing bias binding, and it literally just means sew in the little like the next step down, like the valley of where something's sewn. Um, I wanted to ask where the inspo for the coat came from, um, which is from the live chat. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. Who saw uniforms? Um, they were a regiment that was um, very well known for being reckless um, and they're associated with um, France and Russia and the UK particularly and of course you know Russia, Ravka, Grishavas that kind of yeah immediate association um, so let's move away from that one costume a little bit uh, so the next question that I have written down here is um, any tips for a beginner corset wearer to make sure they do things safely um, so a big a big part of that corsets video was kind of stressing that corsets should be comfortable and they should be wearable and that they are safe but of course there are unsafe ways to wear them um, and there are unsafe corsets if you're wearing something that doesn't fit you properly um, or that you know wasn't made for you or is made with cheap or poor quality materials then it's not going to be comfortable and it can be dangerous to wear um, so I would say you know things to bear in mind if you have for any reason like a reduced lung capacity if you're asthmatic or something like that definitely take that into account um, if you're not used to wearing garments like that then you know plan to of course it's need breaking in as to stays or pairs of bodies um and you know people people would have worn them for short periods and then kind of built up to wearing them every day um and they also would have been um kind of steamed into shape before you even bought them um so you know when we when we buy ready to wear corsets now or when we just finish making something and put it on um we you know we skip that step a lot of the time partly because you know if we're rushing to finish something for an event you don't have time to break it in and wear it and build up to making it comfortable um so just you want to practice if i mean really you should be making the corset before you make a lot of the clothes that will go on top of it anyway so if you can you know wear it and make sure it's broken in and make sure it's comfortable a lot of that comfort will come from how good the fit is um, which is obviously a really difficult thing to to get right if you are just starting out um so, you know, make lots of twirls and make sure, which is mock-ups, make lots of mock-ups, um, make sure it fits you as much as you possibly can before you kind of finish the whole thing and get all the boning in um, and then give yourself time to break it in. And when you are wearing it, pay attention to your body, really. I think that's the most, that's the most um, like important part of that. Uh, really just just listen to what's going on because, you know, whilst I can sit there and say that people don't faint and they don't do this, that that is the true for the majority but sometimes people do um for a, a personal anecdote i was um at uni and i was modeling for someone and i had the flu and we were standing in a very very hot theater and i was wearing uh, lots and lots of regency stuff and lots and lots of layers and i nearly did faint because i was way too warm and i was already ill and wearing course it definitely didn't help it wasn't the sole reason that i nearly passed out but you know pay attention to your body I should not have been wearing all of that stuff whilst I had the flu that was stupid of me um so you know if your if your ribs are hurting or if you feel like you can't breathe properly like get it off take it off and make sure that you're all right before you put it back on um I think that the main thing to remember is that often um ready to wear corsets now aren't cut right um I'm not talking about 
corsets from brands like Red Threaded or something, which is a proper corset maker. I'm talking about like cylindrical tube like eBay corsets, um, which aren't really made to fit a specific person's body. They're made to fit as many different people as they can. Um, and they often, you know, often they'll just be cheap plastic boning. Sometimes you'll get ready to wear ones though with steel boning in and that um, is a lot harsher. The flat steels, they don't, they don't tend to move. So if you're thinking about historical garments, you know, they were usually boned with um, whalebone or reed or spiral steels later in the 19th century. And these these types of boning are much, much lighter and they, they shape your body and they, they, there's, they're a bit more forgiving. Um, I hope that was a, a sufficient enough answer. If, if, if you don't get the answer that you were hoping for, you'd like me to go kind of into more depth with these, then please feel free to message me on any of my social media and I'll happily elaborate even further. Um, and feel free to ask me for clarifications as well. Um, let's see. Uh, quick, quick question from the chat. How long have I been cosplaying for? I started cosplaying on Halloween in 2009. So this October, it will have been 12 years, 11 years, 12 years, I think. It's been a, it's been a long time. Been at this for a while. Um, another question, which was from Instagram. So any garment type or era you've come to enjoy the most? Um, it's no secret that I really love the 18th century. Uh, usually the late 18th century, I'm a huge fan of the 1780s through the 1790s. I particularly love the 1790s. I wrote my dissertation on... Um, colour symbolism in dress during the French Revolution. And I find that period really fascinating because it's such a transitional period between the styles from the 18th century and the Regency styles, um, you know, that we associate with Pride and Prejudice and Jane Austen adaptations. And there's there's a lot of ground to cover between the 1780s and 1800. And the 1790s is where all of that happens. So it's really, really interesting. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of different styles and I think they're really flattering. Both the men's and women's fashion from the 1790s is really, I don't know, just, it's just really flattering and it's a really fascinating and political period for fashion as well, particularly in Europe. Um, I also really love the 1890s. Um, there's a, a common theme here, 90s, although not the 1990s. Um, <laughs> so yeah, 1890s, massive fan of big sleeves. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's just garments from here and there. I I think there's um, you know if you if you spend enough time looking at historical dress to any extent, you'll find things to like about every era. Um, I never thought that I would be particularly fond of the 1830s, and then I watched Gentleman Jack, and it began to grow on me. I wouldn't ever want to wear one of those dresses, um, but they appeal to me more now than they did a few years ago. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think you can find something that you like and enjoy about every every type of garment and every period. No, I mean, you don't have to, um, but for me personally, I, I find it quite easy to find something positive to say about nearly everything. Um, any type of garment, though, to get more specific, I think I really really love making um, uh, English gowns or uh, brebel anglais. They are really interesting to me. Um, which kind of feeds into another question that I'll get onto in a little bit. But yeah, they're really, they just go together in a really fascinating way. And they are, there are so many different styles of them because they were around for so much of the 18th century um, that I just think they're really, really interesting. Um, I really like stays as well. They're not, I've, I've made three pairs um, and they are intense to make and time consuming, but they're, they're really, really fun. Um, and they go together the, the way that, they work in my head is quite natural now so I understand I understand how they go together and it makes sense to me and they just kind of I don't know there's a kind of flow to, to the way certain things are made and I really enjoy that that's one of my favorite things um so let's see let's do the question that kind of relates to that one so do you have a favorite stitch or technique used in a specific historical garment so to get really really minuscule my favorite stitch is um probably a slip stitch I really, really enjoy just slip stitching hems or slip stitching lining in. Um, and I think the stitch I might be doing is probably more technically a felling stitch. There's been a lot of kind of developments in the terminology we use in the dress history community in the last couple of years. Um, and I think felling stitch might be more accurate, um, which is used on a lot of historical garments for um, flat felling seams, which is when you 
you know, you have a seam, you cut one side down really small, you fold the other side over it and then under itself and then you stitch it down to encase the seam and make the garment more hard wearing and to, you know, keep it neat on the inside. Um, I just, I just really like doing that. Um, uh, so favorite garment, or oh, sorry, favorite technique in a specific historical garment. I was talking about the Rebelle Anglaise um, and how it kind of goes together. So those dresses, they were made very quickly. So a mantua maker in the 18th century would have been able to put together a dress without any of the trimmings on it, um, or without all of them, in about 12 hours. Um, if they already had the woman's measurements um, and, and a pattern from the last time she'd been fit. So um, these dresses, you would finish the back completely with all of those um, top stitched seams and you would finish the front edges and then all of the fitting is done through the side back seam which which is here um so i did this at uni because I, I made a red and goat which follows a similar kind of shape to a rubber anglaise when i was at uni and in the fittings we had I, I had it on my model and i it was so quick it was so simple i i ended up having to make a few adjustments to the neckline but apart from that you just literally just push it all backwards and you take out what you don't need from the lining and then you fold the top fabric over and tuck it underneath and top stitch it down. And it was it was so simple. It was so lateral and intuitive. Um, and you could see exactly how these clothes went together that fast. Because if you, you know, you have the right measurements and stuff, then like, you know, it's, it's just really lateral. It just makes sense. Um, so I see there are a few more questions from the chat. So I'm planning to make a quite simple corset for Aurora. I bought some nice wool. Do you think cotton canvas would be okay for the inner layer? I've got steel boning for it. I'll have an underdress underneath it. Um, cotton canvas probably would be okay. It might be a bit light. Depends on the weight of your canvas. Um, I personally really like cotil. It's not something that, um, you know, they had access to until the 19th century, the late 19th century, but it's really, really useful for modern corsetry. Um, there's a the type of canvas that you usually see in um, historical corsets that you can still get now is a, uh, I think we call it linen duck canvas. It's kind of like a hessian brown colour. Um, just like, yeah, like a faded brown colour. Uh, this it really, it really depends on the weight of your canvas. Cotton canvas might be might be good. We did use cotton drill at uni for corsets when, when we couldn't afford uh, cotille. But um, yeah, it, it depends. If, if you're using wool, um, depending on the weight of your wool, again, with the two together, it might be fine. Um, but without without seeing the fabric, it's kind of hard to know. Um, what's the next one? Is 1790 the time period of the Georgian? Do, do you mean Georgiana cosplay? Uh, nearly. So my, my Georgiana cosplay is obviously not a purely historical garment, um, but it is based off of images, um, cartoons particularly, of the real Georgiana Cavendish campaigning in 1784 um, and it's inspired by red and goats from that era so people were fashion didn't move as quickly as it does um, now or as even as quickly as it did in the 20th or the 19th centuries in the 18th century but um, the the red and goat that style would have been more or less the same there would have been differences um, but but yeah that's ne nearly nearly the 1790s um, but specifically 1784. And I think that's the year that that scene in the film is set as well, because that was when she was campaigning for Charles Fox in real life. So um, <laughs> I hope that was a satisfactory answer. Um, so I've got another question here, which came from Instagram, which was, how do I plan for a project? Um, so if we're, depends on the project. Um, a lot of what I've been doing recently has been book cosplay. And obviously a lot of what I do is influenced by his history so you know if it's if it's a purely historical costume often i might want to just recreate something that's in a museum um or in a fashion plate or a painting and if that's the case then you know i'll recreate what i'm seeing if i can see scene lines on it then i know where those are um often a lot of historical garments that are in museum collections will have had patterns taken from them. A lot of the Janet Arnold patterns that are in her books come from um, pieces in the Snows Hill collection, which is a manor house in the UK. Um, so, you know, sometimes there might be an actual pattern for that actual garment out there. Um, but yeah, so if it's if it's purely a historical thing, then I will 
you know, look for the historical references and find something that's as close as I can. And then I will use that to recreate the, the historical garment that I want. Um, so that's what I did with my open robe. Um, the I haven't actually got any photos of it yet, but there are some progress pictures on my Instagram. Um, and that's what I've done with my ribbon anglaise gowns. Um, so it gets a bit more complicated um, when you're doing sort of a cosplay that has historical dress influences in it. Um, so for example, if we take Nikolai as an example, um, I will go through a text um, and you know, you can do this with, you can do this with a, a costume in a TV show or a movie as well. Like you'll be able to, you know, you have more to work from because you can actually see what they're doing. Um, but I personally, when planning for any project will um, start off by gathering references. If that's a book, then I'll gather them from the text um, or from, you know, things that I know the authors mentioned, um, the influences that I know that they've included. If it's from a movie, then I'll, you know, take as many screenshots of it or find as many pictures on Google as I can. Um, you know, or behind the scenes pictures even. Again, Pinterest is a really good resource for that, even if there are lots of stolen images on it. Um, and then I will begin looking for um, a garment from history that is close to that. Again, so I can look at the seam lines um, and or a pattern in, in pattern books that I've got up on my shelf up there. Um, and I'll, I'll build up a kind of resource of like a, a touchstones, I suppose, um, that I can that I can use to build up how I'm going to make the thing. Um, so for Nikolai, I don't have any Hussar uniform um, patterns, but I do know how um, men's coats of that era went together and they were more or less the same with some, you know, differences in style. So, you know, you still have those curving back seams and that would have carried through. So I'll look for a pattern that is the closest I can use and then I'll use it to drape my own. Um, but yeah, planning planning for a project, the very initial stages, I tend not to want to start making something unless I know I've got a good chance of doing it properly and doing it to a standard I like. So I will make sure I can find a lot of the materials I want to use. I'll make sure I know kind of what I'm doing before I start. So I have a mood board or you know a bookmarks folder with lots of resources and reference in it that I can go back to and look at. Um, and then I'll start... Um, Usually I'll start with a pattern. Sometimes I'll start sketching it if I don't have um, like a visual reference. If it's something from a book, I might draw it first. But that depends on the character. It depends how clearly they've been described, how clearly it exists in my head, if there's fan art, because that's something else that I take into account and look at. Um, so again, I'm happy to elaborate on this further if, if anyone would like me to. I'm conscious of how much time I have left, um, but I'm, I will keep going <laughs> if you give me the opportunity to. Um, so... Another question from Instagram, did men wear corsets or stays in any historical period? So conscious as I am of, you know, records that survive and they're incredibly um, like, you know, heteronormative, cis-normative um, twist that they have on them always because of the society we live in. Um, I don't want to say that they never did. Just hands down flat. I'm sure there were some men that wore corsets. Um, same as I'm sure there were some women who wore men's clothes and, you know, th there are historical records of trans and non-binary people who passed and who lived lives in, um, you know, the clothing of the gender that they were um, instead of the sex they were assigned at birth. So from that angle, yes, there were definitely, there were definitely men that wore corsets. Um, but if you're talking about it from a, a fashionable point of view, which I'm, I'm assuming you were, uh, judging from the um like satirical cartoons that survive now from the early 1800s um there was a particular fashion for men to wear corsets um dandies specifically or well dandies was the terminology then but i suppose earlier in the century they would have or into the 18th century they would have called them fops um but they we believe uh would have worn corsets because the fashion was to have um, as opposed to the 18th century, where the fashion was to have quite narrow shoulders, in the early um, 19th century, so we're talking kind of 1806 to like 1830, um, the fashion was to have quite broad shoulders and a very, very narrow waist and very curvy hips and curvy calves. So they would have not only padded out their trousers and padded out the shoulders of their jackets, 
Um, but apparently they also wore corsets. Um, there are some satirical cartoons of men being laced into corsets during that era. But um, I mean, I'm sure some men did. I don't know how widespread it was. It's not something that I am an expert on, but they, they definitely did. They were worn. Um, and I'm sure that earlier there were periods where men also wanted for aesthetic reasons um to control a bit of a, a bit of a gut and may have worn may have worn something similar as well although they probably wouldn't have looked much like the garments that women were wearing at the same time um let's see is there anything else um let's see do do Okay, cool. I don't think I'm glad that this is useful information for craftsmanship judging. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it's helpful. I've been a judge. Um, if anyone ever wants to ask me about that, you can message me. I'm happy to give some insight. That's not related to this at all, but putting that out there. Um, so this is the last question that I actually have from on my list from before. But um, have you ever used curtains to make a cosplay? Uh, this is a fairly simple one. Yes, I have several times. Um, my Philippe dressing gown was a pair of curtains. My Sophie dress was a pair of curtains. Molly Mock's coat was a pair of curtains. It's very useful. Um, they're good. I really like Ikea. If you're looking to do 18th century stuff, um, Ikea have a lot of uh, like heirloom prints that are um, actually, I've got a really dry throat, sorry. Um, <laughs> Ikea have a lot of heirloom prints and patterns which they use for their um, curtains and their duvet cover sets, which are actually 18th century prints um, because printed cottons were hugely popular in the 18th century, specifically from kind of the eight, uh, sorry, 1780s, 1770s-ish onwards. Um, so much so that at points they had to um, ban them because they were so popular, they were undermining the fabric industries in the UK and in France um, because it was cheaper, not cheaper, sorry. It was um, just these, they were so fashionable that people weren't buying silks anymore or they weren't buying wools here in the UK um, because they wanted to wear these Indian chintz um, fabrics and uh, people ignored the law and they bought them anyway. Um, but yeah, so Ikea actually do a lot of those um, and that is where you'll see you'll see them all over the dress history community. Ikea bed sheets turn into dresses, um, which is really fun. Um, but yeah, if anyone if anyone has any other questions, please, please throw them my way. Um, oh, there's one. Any tips to make wigs look more like natural hair? Um, so from a historical point of view, um, there are a few, but uh, from purely from a cosplay point of view, yes, I would say so. So if you're using a lace front, um, they often just have really like round hairlines that aren't very natural. Um, so you can pluck into it to remove hair in certain areas um, and just kind of make it a little bit more natural and interesting looking. Or you can um, get a ventilating hook. And there are there should be tutorials for that on YouTube, and you can ventilate in more hair to you know give something a widow's peak or give a wig sideburns, which I've done a few times um because you know usually these wigs are intended for women and not not for cosplaying men um so yeah i usually also giving them roots um which you can use acrylic paint i think alice and tabitha has a tutorial on that i've also got one on my patreon um for my garret wig which is the same method that i'd use for other things to to add in roots the um the base add in roots where roots would be um also giving them a bit more texture, curling them. Um, obviously check that you have a uh, heat resistant wig that you're dealing with. Um, but yeah, cu curling them definitely. Um, and you know, for, for historical hairstyles, a lot of the time they need to be curled um, for you to be able to pin them up or do anything with them. Um, I tend to rely on wigs for those because I mean, I want to cut all my hair off soon anyway, but uh, my hair's very, very straight. So I can't actually do really any historical styles with it as it is, and wigs just tend to be easier. Um, so let's see. How do you conduct your research? Um, well, it depends. So I think it's a little different for me. Um, I wanna be really like open and honest about this. Um, so I had quite an advantage I, or I have a, quite an advantage with any research I do because I did a degree in this. Um, so when I was studying costume, our um, the head of our course uh, 
was a dress historian. Um, so she did the research for films like uh, Elizabeth the Golden Age and um, oh, Finding Neverland, I think she did too. Maybe the Duchess. So she she basically was who the designer would go to, and they'd ask they'd ask her to do the historical research or provide the historical basis for for you know the era that the film is set in. And she'd come back with all this research, and then they could use that and incorporate that into their designs. Um, and we had a lecture every week on Wednesday that was three to four hours long, and we covered ancient Greece through to about two thousand and five, um, and that has provided kind of the basis and the foundation for a lot of my dress history knowledge um so you know i took copious notes and we had her um like slide lists so we could go and source those images again and look at them um and once you have kind of an outline and an overview of these eras it's really really easy to go in and kind of know roughly what you're looking for to begin with um obviously dress history is such a huge topic you know you're thinking it's centuries of people's clothes um and you know i am very very i want to be very clear about the fact that i only really know the the dress history of kind of europe and i don't even know that in great detail because i can't be an expert in every era um <clears throat> wow sorry <laughs> um so for me if I kind of know what I'm looking for, then I can know which era to go with. Um, so I think the best advice I can give is to start with um, looking at, there are some, they're not super reliable, but they will help you. So there there are like, you'll see them around on the internet, like silhouette kind of timelines for certain centuries. They're a kind of a good starting point. But really, you just want to look at as much stuff from each era as you can. So if you have a character that's from a show and you know which era it's meant to be set in, regardless of how historically accurate the costumes are, you know, if you if you want to make if you want to make something from, I don't know, the Vampire Diaries, not famed for its historical accuracy, um, and you know that something is set in 1860, then you can go and look at what clothes were like in the 1860s and depending on what you're wanting to make you might even do a better job than they did on the show because of their budget or that what they prioritized um so you basically just want to like saturate your brain with as much information from each area as you can if there's a specific area you want to focus on you know you can look at you can go through it by decade and museum collections are a really good place to start with that the um met the metropolitan museum of art which i used for all of my videos because they made their content um they put a lot of it in the public domain is great. V&A, also great. Um, I think the, I, I don't know how many museums have their collections online off the top of my head, but look for museum collections and then you can go through things by the year. So, you know, if, you, if you're interested in the 18th century, you can look at it from, you know, 1710, 1720, just like look at what changes from era to era. Um, and then um, you want to start looking at pattern books because they're not usually only pattern books. They are usually very well researched documents and they will have explanations of, you know, stitches and what fabrics were used and how things went together. And they'll talk about there's um a lot of Nora Wars ones, particularly corsets and crinolines, has um, you know, uh primary sources in it. She's got copies of letters in that book between people discussing things. So, you know, I've mentioned Georgiana Cavendish several times as one from her to her friend where she's talking about um, how a new pair of stays that she's got, she, they're not comfortable yet and they're, they're cutting into her upper arms because the straps sit further back than her last pair. Um, so these books kind of, you know, read them, like pick them up and read them cover to cover. I should take my own advice. I haven't done that. But, you know, you'll, um, you'll learn things and you'll pick things up. I hope that was a, a good enough answer. Um, okay, new question. Hat making is such an interesting part of costume clothing production. How did you find that specialization for yourself? Again, uni. Um, my costume, the, the degree that I did, they wanted us to kind of try as many different things in first year as we could. So we were made to do some design. Um, we made corsets, we did beading, a little bit of wig making. Um, God, what else? Um, we, you know, made petticoats and, and, um, whole kind of very theatrical weird costumes at the same time and then we also did hat making so because of the course I was on I was um we made bonnets um I think the design our, our counterparts in design could make whatever they wanted um but we were taught a little bit of blocking which is um you know forming a hat over a hat block 
And then we made bonnets, which were flat, flat patterned hats made of buckram. Um, and I just, I just really, I just really loved it. I found it instantly not easy, but I understood it. It like just made sense in my head. And I, I really enjoyed every second of it. Um, and realized that that was one of, what I wanted to do. We had a different millinery tutor in second year who I then ended up working for um, until I think she went to work at the um, English National Opera a couple of years ago. So I haven't I haven't worked with her for a while, but um, she was kind enough to give me some work experience when I was in second year. And that just like really solidified that this was what I wanted to do. I think there's something endlessly fascinating about trimming hats. Um, they're just, it's super satisfying. It's kind of like flower arranging, trimming women's hats at least. Um, and then there's, you know, the the very different things, making top hats or blocking tricorns and bicorns and stuff like that. There's something, especially like military style hats like that, you've got to be so neat and precise and careful. Um, but then at the same time, depending on what the hat is for, if it's theatre, you don't necessarily have to be. You can, trimmings can hide an awful lot of sins. Um, they're just, they're just really wonderful to make. Um, <laughs> was Beau Brummel really that much of an expletive? I can't see what the um, word was. I think in at, at the time, people, it's, it's hard to know. I believe he probably was, given how he died. Um, for those not in the know, he died of syphilis, which kind of implies what sort of life he led. People didn't like him. He was a bit of a like Marmite situation. I think. I think a lot of the time during during that period, people thought he was a bit odd, um, and certainly he was pushing boundaries in terms of fashion and what was acceptable. Um, but I think. I mean. He's not, he's not someone I've researched greatly. Uh, I kind of, you know, I know about him because of what he did for trousers. But um, yeah, he, pro he probably was to certain people. To other people, they may have loved him. But that might be for you to decide. If you want to research Bo Brummel and come to your own conclusion, please feel free. Um, so yeah, I mean, if there are any other questions, then I will fave historical hat style. Let's do that. Um, I'm going to make this the last question unless something super interesting comes in in a second. Um, favorite historical hat. I love making bonnets, but I think my favorites are, oh man, um, she keeps, I, I love Georgiana Cavanagh. She keeps coming up. Um, there's an excellent biography of hers by Amanda Foreman, which is what the film is based on, um, by the way, if people are interested. But um, there's actually a type of hat in the 18th century that, that she really popularised. She invented it um, and it was called the picture hat because it was what she wore when she was painted by Gainsborough for a portrait that um, I believe has vanished into someone's private collection. We don't actually know where it is anymore, but it's a really beautiful style of hat. It's very simple. It's got a huge brim, um, a kind of fairly, fairly simple like almost cone-like crown. Um, they're usually black and they're just really gorgeous. They're really elegant hats. I, I used to love those an awful lot. I think my favourite at the moment is the like shorter squatter top hats, which kind of came in at the beginning of the 1800s. I really like those, but there are an awful lot of styles of hat I like. Um, it's like it's like asking someone to choose their favourite child. Um, I would love an excuse to make... Um, to make oh gosh i'd like to do some more military stuff i'd love to do some some bicorns with lots of um naval lace on them and, and gold braid and stuff although i'd probably need to get some proper blocks if i was doing it on that level um but yeah i want to make some more top hats I've got top top hat blocks coming soon um so i'd love to make some more of them um but yeah i hope that was a satisfactory answer as i've said too many times if anyone wants me to follow up on, you know, any of these questions, then you feel free to message me on any of my social media. Um, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok, although TikTok might be, not be the best platform for long conversations. Um, Instagram and TikTok is Wood Smoke and Words. Uh, Twitter is Wood Smoke Words because of their character limit. Um, and yeah, I, I hope I hope that this was interesting. If you if you want to chat more about historical dress, then come find me on any of those uh, platforms and I will continue to talk about it <laughs> endlessly. It will be a struggle to get me to stop. Um, but yes, thank you for coming. Um, super, super glad that this was such a lively discussion. And um, I, I hope to discuss more historical dress stuff with people in the future. <laughs>